The following is an excerpt from a conversation with Lance's Legion and the Warrior Philosopher. Their channels are linked in the description. First of all, being a longtime fan of your work and especially absolute top aesthete uh, in our sphere here, and I'm, I'm surprised, you know, you should be like 100,000 followers so, thus far, but, you know, such is the uh, whim and fate of life, right? Um, but in the future, we'll, we'll command Legion, so don't worry. But in any case, I was just uh, considering, you know, a lot of the issue that surrounds our, our current time has to do with you know, meeting people in, in real space and not just being meeting a pro by proxy through the internet or through mediums and actually talking, hanging out with people. And I think one of the earliest, I guess, most uh, impactful experiences I ever had was doing jujitsu at the age of five. And it's there, especially in jujitsu, there's like this ethic that, you know, it's more about you know, your will to win as opposed to necessarily being bigger or stronger than the opponent. And of course, these things have bearing, but the main crux of, I feel like, is our principle or spiritual principle is the agonal spirit, the agonal principle, which is to say, you know, what's right or wrong is he who wins and he who loses is wrong. Does that make sense? And I wanted to get your perspective on that, Ark, and see what you feel about that. I think um, on the one hand, it's definitely an interesting frame to go kind of full Nietzschean and assert that truth is power and uh, victory is truth, right? Those who win are in the right. But at the same time, I think that that's a kind of simplistic representation of what Nietzsche was writing about and kind of what we stand for. Uh, and the example I always use is people sometimes comment on my channel, well, there's an elite now, you know, aren't uh, the Bezoses and the, <laughs> the uh, Mark Zuckerbergs, aren't they the Ubermensch of the modern world? But, you know, there's something deeper to the might makes right ethos. And, and that deeper thing, I think, like you say, is the will to win and the will to life uh, the will to beauty the will to power the will to strength and that is what's lacking in our current elite although zuckerberg i've seen him <laughs> doing something recently so i'm not so sure he might be the ubermensch of the future after all <laughs> but uh he might he might start competing in uh mma or ufc under the uh, pseudonym of the lizard man you know <laughs> yes <laughs> But even you see with Nietzsche, you know, he was very sickly. Uh, Caesar had his own health issues, epilepsy, it seems, perhaps. And so, uh, yeah, I'd say on the one hand, um, you know, victory is truth in a certain sense. And you must understand that to operate in the world. But on the other hand, uh, the deeper truth is the will to power and the, the will to victory itself. Absolutely. And if I could Absolutely. just add a couple things to that, I think what's missing in today's elite, so when if someone comes up to you and they're like, well, we have an elite today, right? Uh, ultimately, there is a great subversion of what makes a people an elite in this modern age, I think. And because you see the primacy of the merchant class over the warrior class, more so over the past maybe two, three hundred years, it's, it's ultimately a subversion of will to power. The merchant's will to power does not engage with elemental forces it does not engage with war and battle it engage with it engages with the manip with the manipulation of things that represent value so money for example if you think about like you know crypto bros today and you know i'd love to be rich off of crypto don't get me wrong i'd love to make a meme coin that makes 10 million dollars but you have to ask yourself what is somebody that's like a stock trader or a crypto bro actually contributing in terms of value? They're simply learning how to manipulate value. Same with the merchant. You are purchasing things as at as low a price as you can and then reselling it at as high a price as you can. It's a subversion of value and a manipulation of value. So when we look at the elite today, I think one of the reasons that we have this sort of disdain for them is that we don't feel that they are representing a true manifestation of power. And of course, it's like, who's to say what that, that true manifestation is? But I think all of us can certainly see that 
the heroic ideal, the military ethos, there's something more authentic and raw uh, that is possessed within that, that is lacking in a, an economic elite that, that really, after the first generation, like Jeff Bezos, his kids don't have any incentive to be great. They will inherit that money. I don't know if he has kids. I know he got divorced, so maybe he doesn't have kids, but any of these guys, right? Like Bill Gates, I think, has a daughter. They don't really have an incentive to be as great as their parents, the way the warrior does. If you, if your father was this great warrior king, whether it be in medieval Europe or beforehand, if you did not live up to close, at least close to your father's expectations, you'd be conquered. You would be defeated by somebody stronger than you. There was a reason why the system, so to speak, worked and it worked because war was the great mediator of decadence. If you grew too decadent, you would fall in battle. And this, this element does not exist today in the sort of economic classes that run society. So I, I, two thoughts come to mind, right? And I think this is the delineating factor, especially in philosophy. We talk about, you know, how do we perceive the world, right? And I think the main delineating factor between us and, for instance, Platonism or the post-Socratics is we're a becoming, not a being. Right. So the emphasis is it sounds like when I say that, it sounds like the it's splitting hairs, but it's not right, because a becoming is a constant thing, a living thing, an expanding thing or a dying thing. There's an arc. Right. Um, there is a, uh, no a changeability. Intended. Yeah, not exactly. <laughs> There's, there isn't this immutable factor of life. Everything is coming. Everything is going right. What goes comes again. What uh, comes goes again and what does this mean all right well let's look at our life this is the second point that i'm trying to make our little lifespan whether you live 20 years or like even 120 years you know there's some people that live to 113 years somehow right i can't imagine a worse fate but anyway <laughs> uh, what i'm trying to say is that from our perspective in life it seems as though the you know especially because of the titanic forces at work, especially politically, but culturally speaking, uh, the environment, whatever. But over a long enough timeline, things change. We are in constant motion, just that our lifetime is so short that that, that change is so incremental that it's imperceptible. And what I'm trying to extrapolate and finish this analysis is saying that this bourgeois elite isn't an elite. What they are doing are parasites, is basically parasiting off of a carcass. This carcass is dying. They're not really rulers. They just, so for instance, the ARC gets that comment, for instance, isn't Mark Zuckerberg the ubermensch of our time? I would disagree. Because at the end of the day, Ubermensch are not present in every time. Also, the decadence of our time only gives rise to a crust of people who are fundamentally yeast. And just because they're able to put, you know, wealth together doesn't mean that they're superior. It doesn't. And additionally, just because they have superior intellect also doesn't mean that they're superior. And obviously, I understand the implication where I kind of negate kind of the contradiction when I say that the body is is the measure of all things. So the mind as well as the physical uh, physical, you know, muscle or physicality of a person. But what I'm trying to say is that at base, it's also a matter of temperament. It's a matter of spirit. It's a matter of taste. Life is an aesthetic value, right? Mm -hmm. I think I think what I'm trying to say is that ultimately just because here and now it seems as though these concepts don't exist over a long enough timeline, they do. To think of it, Napoleon was only a blink of an eye or a flicker of a candle, you know, in the course of history. Just because we don't live in a time where there are great men doesn't mean that they're permanently dead. It just means that we are like moles with very myopic vision over what the arc of life really is and that is exceptionally long if not infinite yes definitely definitely and i like what you said about taste because to go back i guess to nietzsche he's proposing this very interesting thing which is if you don't look at history as progressive as progressing towards something especially towards any type of utopia or moral progress then how do you judge ages and the conclusion he draws and i think the conclusion you would have to draw is you have to judge 
ages by uh, their quality than the quality of the people they produce and also the culture they produce, the art they produce. And then you're kind of looking at history almost zoologically, right? Like you would look at an you know, evolutionary history of life. You might look at a certain age and say, wow, look at all the fantastic creatures that were uh, produced during this age. Isn't it a shame that they're extinct? Um, and you know, ultimately on the evolutionary line, maybe they didn't progress towards anything, but they created, uh, you know, nature, I guess you could say created during that age, uh, fantastic creatures, which were kind of an end in themselves. And so I think when people say, well, you know, aren't, aren't the elite today, uh, Ubermensch or, you know, isn't the, isn't Nietzsche just saying that whoever wins is the Ubermensch, right? And I think what they're missing is that judgment uh, upon the quality of an organism or of a culture uh, because ultimately the will to power is all is you know a kind of biological drive right it's the will to life and so you can kind of perceive it viscerally right the will to power is not just holding a position of power it's a it's a will and and a being and you can sense when that's lacking in a culture right you can sense yes. it kind of um the Buddhist hippie uh, <laughs> liberal kind of ethos like yeah we should just you know be nice to everyone and uh, you know go vegan and do as little harm as possible you can just instinctually tell that you know the will to life and power is lacking there mm -hmm. because you understand on a uh, instinctual level that you know life is competition life is the will to power and, and healthy organisms uh, pursue power and life and that that's expressed in certain ways you know through physical beauty through the beauty of action um, so yeah if you look to history uh, assessing quality and looking for the will to power in that way then you know <laughs> Zuckerberg despite his MMA doesn't quite live up to <laughs> so, yeah, please <laughs> yeah no it's that's great and I wanted to add something to that you know because we're talking about the constant state of becoming and like okay well how do you judge uh, a historical epoch i think you know ultimately what distinguishes the true distinction of of the political spectrum you know beyond the french revolution beyond economics beyond all this 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 shit i think what really you know the real distinction you can make is is kind of almost the distinction between nietzsche and hegel hegel believing in a sort of historical progress like you're talking about that's sort of the the, the neo-Marxist, the leftist, you know, from Marx to Zizek today, I mean, they're essentially Hegelists. They, they, they believe that there is this, this progress of morality. And when you do that, you can use it to subdue aspects of the past that threaten a specific sort of regime that rules on subversion, rules by institution. Because they've, you know, the neo-Marxists use this Hegelian view of the progress of history, it discounts aspects of the past that are superior to the present. And what this does is, this gives us the idea that modern man should be domesticated, pacified, and castrated. And it is exactly what is happening today from, literally from the time you're a child, in America at least, uh, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but you're not allowed to fight, you're not allowed to roughhouse, you're not allowed to play tag even because they're afraid someone's going to slip and fall and the parents are going to sue the school. It's so lame. Like, you're, you're domesticating man. You're taking all that vital energy, that vital energy, that almost depression. It's like, it's a good kind of depression where it's like, I'm not satisfied with this. I'm going to embark on a on, on fulfilling my Faustian ambitions to go to distant lands and conquer them, whatever. It's hard to do that when you're well-fed, you're comfortable, and everybody's like, oh, no, 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 you know? What you need is, is, is these, these manners. What you need is this rule of law that's going to, to make you complete, you know? We're progressing towards something perfect, a perfect utopia. And that's just not the case. That's not, that's not what invokes a real sort of uh, affirmation of life. It, it is life denial. Uh, in a lot of ways and I guess what I'm getting at is that's the distinction is becoming versus just I have became I have finished this this progress you know it's like I was telling Lance the other day it's like in, in Fight Club where he talks about you know I'm gonna create the perfect home the perfect Ikea nest right no one's ever <laughs> gonna be complete and that is the difference between us is like we seek perfection knowing we'll never attain it the left a lot of times today 
They want to be fat and lazy or super skinny or super dysgenic because they want a final end state. They can't stand the fact that you're constantly going to be pain or in pain. You're con we are fire. We are living fire. I said this before. We are living fire and we are constantly burning. And of course, we may be extinguished with death, but there's never like we're never there's never like a completeness to that we're never going to be complete and they want to be complete so if their completeness is is mediocrity and this and a dysgenic sort of end state of ugliness and being fat and lazy then they will take that because what they seek most of all is comfort and a final solution